heart into the joints and marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which is what we shall be doing uh, this day. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using the principle of confession of sin found in 1 John 1, 9 uh, in order to get back into fellowship and be controlled by God the Holy Spirit. Uh, let us, therefore, spend a few moments in silent prayer using confession of sin as the basis of our prayer at this time. Let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God, and for the plan of God, and for all that your grace provides. Thank you that we have in our hands an infallible, inspired book that is absolutely reliable and trustworthy in every form, uh, that uh, in the original languages, so that we may use it as the basis for all of our living and godlikeness in this world in which we have to live. We set apart this time now in order that our Lord Jesus Christ may receive honor and glory as we communicate the written word which speaks of the living word in the end result that Jesus Christ, our Savior, may become in each one of us our all in all. I ask in his name, amen. As we come now to uh, continue our study of the doctrine of fragmentation, we, I want to remind you again of the principle that the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has three enemies. The unbeliever has no choice. The unbeliever is a dichotomous person. That is, he has a body which makes him conscious of that which is around him, he has a soul which makes him conscious of himself. But the thing that is lacking is the spiritual dimension. He does not have a human spirit which makes him conscious of God and cognizant of spiritual phenomena. He just cannot relate to those things. This person is said to be totally depraved. There is nothing in this person which can commend him to God in any way. And there is nothing in this person which causes him to seek after God. No man in his totally depraved condition seeks after God. God always takes the initiative, and God provides to every member of the human race God consciousness. This is described for us in the first chapter of the book of Romans, and it is described in three terms. The first is that the human race, uh, wherever they are, and regardless of the geographic location, comes to understand that there is... A, uh, a, a person who is a, a supreme being. This person has fantastic power and that there is some kind of retribution uh, for those who reject this person uh, of power. If uh, at this point then the free will and volition of every member of the human race is brought into play. If that person rejects the knowledge of this God, then God is no longer obligated to give him any further information of any kind. In fact, we read that these people have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for uh, uh, likenesses of uh, birds, beasts, reptiles, and even uh, man himself. And therefore, God gave them over to the uh, natural uh, end result of this rejection. If a person goes positive at the point of God consciousness, that does not make him a Christian. Just believing that there is a God does not save anyone. However, at the point of God consciousness, a person who goes positive will receive from the source of the same God gospel hearing. That is, he will hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in which he will come to discover 
that God, uh, in eternity past, uh, God the Father created a plan that called for God the Son to go to uh, earth to add to his always existing deity perfect humanity. This is revealed by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ, though he was a man and a man like uh, all of us, yet without sin, was qualified to go to the cross of Calvary and to bear all sin for all men for all time so that the issue now between God and man is no longer his sins, but it is what will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ. Now, if man realizes this, now his, function, his volition will function again. If he goes on negative volition at the point of gospel hearing, hearing about our Lord Jesus Christ, he joins those who rejected uh, at this point, and he will spend an eternity in a place which is called the lake of fire, which God has created for disobedient angels, but where man who goes on negative volition can join him. Those who go on positive volition at the point of gospel hearing are said to be born again uh, or saved, uh, regenerated. Uh, there are many terms which are used to describe uh, this person. But he passes from death unto life uh, at that moment in time. And in addition to that, he becomes trichotomous, that is, he continues to have the body, uh, and the body will have to be changed. His soul at that point in time is saved, but he also receives a human spirit at that point in time, and the human spirit now makes it possible for this person to have fellowship with God. The soul and the spirit will live forever. The body will have to be changed or transformed. Now the issue is the Christian way of life. Where do we go from here? Uh, as uh, uh, everyone knows, the journey of a thousand miles is begun with the first step. You begin by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, up until this point, you have lived in the sphere of the devil, uh, or Satan. Shatan was his uh, uh, Hebrew title. Uh, you lived in his uh, sphere. You were totally under his control. Now, you have passed, having passed from death unto life, you now have the potential of living inside or under divine control, control of God. But again, your free will and volition comes into play. How will you live the Christian way of life? We're working on a visual. Bill is going to make it. He's very good at those things. Uh, in which we sort of present it uh, like this. Uh, um, that uh, there comes a point in, in time in everyone's life when they have to make a salvation decision. Uh, if they reject, they immediately go to a uh, we'll, uh, lake of fire. I mean, that, they're headed for the lake of fire. God may give them other opportunities, but he's not obligated to do that. That's grace. Now he starts on the, the, uh, the heavenly road, or the road to heaven. We draw it like a, a city, heavenly city. But we also point out that there are, there are two ways to go to the heavenly city. Uh, because there are going to be constant decisions which have to be made, and this uh, road this road may uh, is the negative volitional road. You're gone your way to heaven, and you eventually will get to heaven, but along the way, your volition will be tested consistently, and it will be tested by adversity, by hardship, by prosperity, by uh, opportunity uh, all along the way. And at any given point, uh, that person who is on this road may go to this one. And a person on this road may go to this one, simply by using his volition in the proper way. A positive volitional decision will put a person and keep a person on this road. A negative volitional decision will put a person on this road, which is the road of uh, divine discipline. At the same time, God allows Satan the opportunity to tempt these persons because we are living uh, with an, a formidable enemy, which has been our subject along the way. And that formidable enemy is known as the devil uh, and known as Satan, as we have seen. His, his uh, uh, proper name is Lucifer. Now, the devil has um, uh, his minions, which are called demons. Demon simply means supernatural being. And they have a tremendous effect on people. We all, the, the people, uh, members of the human race, uh, also live in 
the devil's world, the world system. The world system is called the cosmos in the Greek. And uh, uh, living under the cosmos, they live under the policy of Satan, which is evil. And uh, they also uh, have inside of themselves, every member of the human race, even though he's born again, has an old sin nature, which is the devil's inside agent. This formidable foe means to every one of us that we must take advantage of the divine operating assets which God, in his matchless grace, uh, unearned and undeserved, has provided for the believer to be able to resist the fantastic power of the super being, uh, Satan, uh, in a system which is cons consistently against him and the old sin nature which is inside of him. And that's the subject we're talking about uh, when we talk about the fragmentation of the soul. Um, I just finished the book on prayer yesterday and it'll be printed this week. And uh, uh, it should be ready by Tuesday, depending on uh, whether or not Wayne goes fishing tomorrow. <laughs> oh, well, good. So you've got enough now. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, um, it's an important book, and it's going, to, it's going to make a lot of people angry because the multitude of believers have their prayer coming from uh, their prayer basis coming from uh, their neighbors or their friends the people they associate with the system in which they lived for years uh, or what they always thought or what other people are thinking rather than from the scripture and um, it's an amazing thing how many people are affected by these things and by the evil system of the world and the demons along the way uh, I have I asked Bill to read uh, the book as I finished it to sort of check up and see uh, how it went along and he's very kind uh, uh, but we were stopping to talk and he gave me a fantastic illustration uh, for one of the, the in one of the chapters which I used in an abbreviated form uh, but he wrote it out for me and I'm going to read to you something that will probably shock many of you people who are here today and those who are watching on television and listening by means of radio because you have been accustomed to thinking in terms of prayer on the basis of what the enemy has taught you, and you have never bothered to check it out with the Word of God. You have just assumed that it's correct. Let me read this for you and then make some comment. I'll read it in its entirety, even though some of the things have to do with application. Only, he, Bill says, the written Word of God is to be the foundation for our spiritual truth. Not the written Word plus our experiences. Not the written word plus our impressions. Not the written word plus dear old Dr. So-and-so's vision or dream. Not the written word plus our spiritual feeling. Friend, the written word and only the written word is to be our source of spiritual truth. Spiritual deception frequently results from the, quote, open door lie, which says the Bible is one source of truth for our spiritual lives, but not the only one. Let me give you a personal illustration. While serving as pastor of a church, I had concluded through a series of events that God was giving to me spiritual impressions. I determined that I should act immediately on these impressions as a show of faith. I believed God would honor this show of faith with some miracle. I had convinced myself that to hesitate about the impression would be seen as a lack of faith and a resulting loss of some miracle. To ignore the impression altogether would be to miss God's special will for the moment. I had failed to see that I was being led even further down the road of deception by powerful forces that were not good but evil. This and what followed was not the power of God. In fact, God had nothing to do with it at all. I uh, and the others involved had only assumed it was God and because it appeared to, to be working with us and not against us, we believed it was good and therefore of God. How wrong we were and how dangerous it is to mix impressions, feelings, and experiences with the written word in order to build your spiritual life. Let me continue with my illustration and tell you what followed. I think it will help you to see how satanic forces set us up 
to see demonstrations of miracles and, quote, answered prayers that were not of God, but of evil forces in an effort to further deceive and further manipulate we who were so ignorant and gullible. It was a Sunday morning and church had started. I was on the platform and the song director was leading the congregation and singing of some hymn. I wasn't paying much attention to any of them at the moment because I was receiving one of those special spiritual impressions. I had previously explained to the congregation about these impressions that I had been receiving and that I decided that I would act immediately upon them to demonstrate faith and receive the miracle from God. Well, now it was time. I stopped the service to do what I felt strongly impressed to do. I stood up and announced that there was someone there who was to give $5,000 to help with the church project we had recently undertaken. Now, I must tell you that this was very hard for me to do. I did not ever find it easy to ask for money from anyone for any reason. But I felt strongly impressed to do this. I allowed my impression to become another source of spiritual truth. Almost before I could get the words out of my mouth, a lady in the congregation stood up and said, It's me. I'm the one who is to give the $5,000, and God has impressed on me that if I will do it, he will answer my special prayer request. I have often wondered what this lady's husband was thinking. He was sitting right beside her. And uh, the lady's request was for the healing of her little baby grandchild. I must tell you, nothing had been medically confirmed wrong with the little baby. She had, however, convinced herself that the baby had a terrible disease. Anyway, she gave the money, and within weeks, she also gave a testimony that, to the whole congregation that this baby was examined by medical professionals and that everything was A-OK, -okay. She was positive that her prayer had been answered and her giving had been rewarded. Now, you may chuckle about this and think it's foolishness, but at the time, I fully believed the impression was from God and that, at, and even now, uh, there is no question about the existence of a powerful force. And the lady paid $5,000. I think that shows a great deal of seriousness. It was not something that was taken lightly or as foolishness by any of those present. The people of the church were all impressed with the series of events impressed with my spirituality and my revelation from God, impressed with my faith in responding to it immediately, impressed with the lady's gift of $5,000, impressed with her prayer and her faith, impressed with the healing of the baby. Everyone was excited. Everyone seemed to feel God's presence. Everyone was praising God for all those things, and the sense of expectation of even greater miracles was high. Every single thing that happened could have been the activity of spirits, evil spirits, playing with the desires and the prayers of ignorant believers. In fact, that's exactly what had happened. God had nothing to do with any of it. My so-called spiritual impressions were not from God, but from the sources of darkness. My, the lady's impression were from the same source. We had been set up. The intent was to cause us all to put greater value on impressions while the written word of God, which is the only solid foundation, is set aside. The intent was to cause us to have faith in faith, not faith in God. The intent was to cause us to believe in a power of prayer which does not exist. The intent was to cause us to focus on phenomenal miracles to distract from the written word which teaches the truth we need. Only by the grace of God and the truth in his written word have I learned that much of what is credited as spiritual is error. No, not just error, but arrogance and opportunities for powerful demonstrations of the way of satanic forces who will imitate the truth, answer your prayers, even give you the desires of your heart, so long as it distracts you from the written word and the truth it teaches. Good for you, Bill. <laughs> When Satan is called an angel of light and his ministers are called ministers of righteousness, we should not really be surprised at all kinds of variations of what I have shared in my personal illustration. Beware of anything that distracts from the written word of God, even if it is called church, prayer, miracles, good, spiritual, or whatever. The presence of a supernatural power does not automatically mean it is from God. I tell you with certainty that evil forces can work miracles. Forces of darkness can answer prayers. Your only hope of overcoming deception is with knowledge of the truth. 
Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, separate believers with knowledge of the truth. Then he says, your word is truth. Friend, as you come to know the written word of God, and only as you come to know the written word of God, will you overcome the deception and confusion that has infiltrated the church today. Bill is 100% right on in that. We have people who are looking today at circumstances as an indication that God is doing something. If you want to follow circumstances and read circumstances, you are going to do more than any human being is able to do. In the, in the book of Acts, we have uh, perhaps uh, one of the better illustrations of how not and, and what, what happens when you try to read the circumstances. Turn to Acts 28. Beginning in verse 1, Acts 28. This is after the, the ship uh, uh, foundered on the way from, uh, to, uh, with Paul to Rome uh, as he was a prisoner to be uh, taken uh, before the magistrates and eventually, uh, well, he didn't appear before Nero, but he was supposed to. The, the ship foundered and they were in the sea. And finally, he says, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and he put it on the fire. A viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. This is a poisonous snake. Now, here is circumstances. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Circumstances tell you he must be wrong. He must be terrible. He must be a sinner escaping the sea. God is now punishing him. Ah, but circumstances are going to change, and they're going to read circumstances another way. Verse 5, But Paul shook the snake off the fire, into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up uh, or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said, He is what? A God. Now he's not a murderer, but the circumstances say he's a God. You cannot read circumstances. Circumstances do not mean a thing. Uh, uh, I have three hundred dollars, and here comes an opportunity that I thought, and I it, it, the cost is exactly three hundred dollars. This is God leading me. God does not lead that way. That is not God. God leads through the written word of God, and unless a circumstance can be backed up by something that is said in the word of God, it is satanic influence. It is not of God. You can't read open and closed doors that way either. You can't say that God is opening doors or closing doors on the basis of circumstance. The Apostle Paul prayed for opportunities, and there are five or six occasions in which he refers to open doors as opportunities. And those doors may change. At one time they're closed, another time they're open. The Apostle Paul kept on going. And there are people, you know, Lord, lead me, uh, uh, and they pray, and that's a ridiculous prayer, because you don't go on the basis of prayer, you go on the basis of orientation to the plan of God. How do you orient to the plan of God? Only one way, through the Word of God, and you have multitudes of believers who are being distracted from the truth of the Word of God and led, distracted from the plan of God by means of satanic uh, operation of deception. I will be like God. I will be... Never forget that. Satan said, I will be like God. And just because someone 
prays about everything doesn't mean they're spiritual. As a matter of fact, the more you pray about things, the less spiritual you are. And I'll tell you why. Because the more oriented you are to the plan of God, the more you rest in who and what He is and His character and know that the Heavenly Father has never made a mistake in all of human history in dealing with any member of the human race and you simply rest in who and what He is and your prayer is not that kind of stuff. It's fellowship with God. It's babies who run to Papa and Mama. Daddy, give me this. Daddy, give me that. I want this. I want that. I want this. It's young people. I want a new bike. I want this. I want that. Even teenagers. Gimme, 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 gimme. When you get to be an adult in a family and you're still going to your dad with your hand out, you're an infantile, immature baby. But when you come to be an adult, and you go to your father and you sit down and have a chat with him and you talk about things of, of common interest and common concern. That's maturity. And that's what it is. You, I challenge you this. What is the greatest prayer that has ever been prayed by any member of the human race? John chapter 17. I close my book with that. It's a prayer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The, which is really the Lord's prayer. It's the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven has nothing to do with this dispensation. None of us wants to be forgiven as we forgive others. That's ridiculous. None of us is praying, Thy kingdom come. We're not looking for a kingdom. We're looking for the Savior from heaven. Just put that away. That's up for another dispensation. In John chapter 17, it's fantastic. Verses 1 to 6, the Lord Jesus prays for Himself. Then in verses 7 to 19, He prays for His disciples and in 20 to 26, he prays for the church age believers. And I'm going to, here to tell you, there are four requests in that book, in that prayer. Four requests. And every one of them is oriented to the plan of God. And you want to, you want to talk about how to talk to your Heavenly Father? You want to talk, find out the nobility the magnificence, the beauty, the glory of that prayer. What, and that is the whole subject. Here is when you come down to the very bottom line of that prayer, there is going to be one word that's going to stand out, it's going to jump out at you, it's going to sock you between the eyes. Because this is what it is. G-L-O-R-Y. Glory. And that means uh, to... Uh, the doxic, the Greek word, has to do with reputation, honor, uh, praise. It has to do with glorifying God the Father. Glorify God. And that's the end result of man in this whole life. You, the reason you're here on this earth, beloved, is to bring honor and glory to God. Never, ever forget that. And if you know that, and you pray according to that, oh, it's just the most fantastic prayer. I, I was, even in studying and preparing, the tears came to my eyes as I read this magnificent prayer of our Lord and Savior as He prays for Himself. You'll be surprised what He doesn't ask for. You compare verses 1 to 6 with the average prayer of the average believer day in and day out. It is, there's no comparison. And yet, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you are having produced in you the character of Christ, your prayer should be ver virtually what the Lord Jesus' prayer was. How, how God glorifies Himself in your life is going to be different than the way He did it in Jesus' life. He glorified the Lord Jesus Christ by the death, resurrection, ascension, and session. Yours will be different, but it's the same end. And when He prayed for His disciples, oh, it's just, it's just fantastic. And looking down through the years, not in omniscience, but uh, in, his, in, in, in the plan of God, He looked down but to those who would believe on me because of their testimony. Let me tell you, beloved, that's a prayer. It's a magnificent prayer. It's orientation to the most fantastic plan that comes. See, perfect God came up with a perfect plan for imperfect people. And that imperfect plan cannot in any way be affected by men or angels. 
that perfect plan moves on inexorably from time to eternity, and nobody or no thing can throw that plan off of its track. Orientation to that plan is the most important thing that can take place in your life. Tragically, there are more fundamental believers who have been distracted by the charismatic movement than we dare to even believe or dream as far as praying is concerned. They are living under the control of the evil system, doctrine of demons, and they are fu functioning under the power of their old sin nature. But you see, the old sin nature, remember, has two trends. You must never forget that. The trend for to some is toward loose living. They're easy to spot for the most part. Not always. Sometimes they put on a good front. But the loose livers are the people who live in profligacy, uh, live in uh, debauchery, uh, the, the drunkard, the dope addict, the sex fiend. That's easy to see. What people don't see is the trend toward asceticism and moral degeneracy. When the old sin nature takes over, these people become more religious. More religious. They're not going to go around and quit going to church. What kind of an idiot do you think you're talking to? Of course they're not going to become less religious. But you see, the Apostle Paul uh, is very, very careful to make a, a distinction. And he warns, you see, we talk about the doctrine of separation. Uh, and uh, separation is to be unto God. And we talk about being separated from, uh, you know, the unbeliever, and uh, uh, that's fine. But there's a lot of believers you ought to be separated from. And I'll tell you, Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. If there's anything that causes divisions, it's charismatic movement today. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you. This is the Greek word there. It's not beseech at all. Looks like that in the Greek. Here's the English. P-A-R-A-K-A-L-E-O. -A 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 Kaleo means to call. Para means alongside. This is, therefore, a word of exhortation. He's, he's giving a word of exhortation. He's not begging us. He's not uh, beseeching us. He's exhorting us. Now I exhort you, brethren. That's the members of the fellow members of the royal family. And he says, skopeo. Now he could have used another word, S-K-O-P-E-O -E in the Greek. Skopeo is a very important word. Uh, he could have used blepo, and he does in many cases. Uh, B-L-E-P-O. Blepo does mean to be on the alert. But skopeo means to be discerning, extremely discerning. The pastor is called the uh, episcopeo, the overseer, the one who uh, has more discernment than the congregation, supposedly, because he knows more doctrine. And so he doesn't use this ordinary word for warning, which is used, for example, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 12, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 that uh, you should be on the alert, be on the alert, alert uh, lest you should uh, assume uh, that uh, because you have been spiritual in the past, you will always be spiritual in the future. He, that's not, uh, that, that's where he uses bluffer, but here is a strong word for, for using discernment. Uh, toward who? The, uh, the ones uh, causing divisions. Uh, it's a, a daco uh, stasis, looks like this.
D-I-C-H-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. Uh, uh, here is dikos. Uh, dichotomy meaning two. Uh, stasis stands uh, uh, to mean to meaning to stand to stand in two different directions. To cause, and this is in the passive, so it's a passive participle, with one causing to stand in two uh, different directions. Uh, causing divisions is a good word to translate it, but it's the, 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 uh, the underlying word is beautiful because it's, it's breaking apart. Uh, it is actually a part of this matter of fragmentation we talking, we're talking about. You see? Here is the fragmentation of the church. Just like the old sin nature is causing a fragmentation of the soul, as I talked about on Thursday evening. They cause uh, divisions, they cause fragmentations and uh, offenses. Here's the word. S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. Scandalon. Now, you recognize scandal is in here, and that, but that's not what the word means. A scandalon is not a scandal. It's a trap. It was, a, it was used a, a, or a trap for catching unsuspecting animals. Uh, like I've often drawn it uh, like this, although this is not what was meant. Uh, here is a, a box. Uh, this is a stick. They put bait over here. When the animal gets in, they pull the stick, the stick out, and the, bo the, the box traps the animal. But uh, that's only because I can draw a box, and I can't draw some of the other kinds of traps. But you know the traps that, that they use with the steel jaws, you know, and the bait goes in the middle. When the animal steps on here, those things come up, and whack! It just catches them, and that can, it can kill them if it hits them in the wrong place. And animals have been known to eat their own legs off to get out of these kind of traps. But it's a trap. And so he says, be discerning, brethren, to, uh, uh, and I'm exhorting you to, to, to be discerning uh, regarding the ones causing uh, fragmentation or divisions and uh, traps. And how do they do it? Uh, it's here's the, here are the two words para and didaskal uh, didaskale uh, para remember you've already seen it in parakale oh it means alongside didaskale is teaching teaching which is alongside the truth that's what they're doing and he says. Turn away from them. For verse 18, he says, For such men serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own koilia. K-O-I-L-I-A. And koilia is an anthropomorphic term. And that means it uses a human description of something in order to describe a spiritual phenomenon. And the human experience that it uses is the word belly, but it refers to emotions. They serve their own emotions. Look out for people who are not controlled by doctrine, teaching beside doctrine, adding something else to doctrine. And not taking text out of context. You can prove anything by taking a text out of context. Anything at all. But what does it go on to say? By means of dia plus the uh, genitive uh, case equals through or by means of. It's in instrumentality. Here's how they do it. They don't come along with a big sign and say, this is heresy. No, they come along with a big sign in the front and says, I am of Satan. They don't do that. Satan came, according to 2 Corinthians 11, disguised as an angel of light. It is no wonder that his ministers come as ministers of righteousness. You wouldn't listen to them if they said minister of unrighteousness on the front, would you? Of course not. And you wouldn't go if it said First Church of the Coven. You're going to go where, it's, where, it's the, where it says the church. All right, all right, here's what it says. By means of what? Well, uh, here's the word. C 
C-H-R-E-S-T-O, Christologia. Now, logia means words. Homologeo means to speak the same as homo. Where that becomes H-O-M-O becomes the prefix. Cresto means good or fair or uh, 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 appearance of, uh, of beauty can be used for beautiful. Beautiful words, fair words, good words, they don't come with words that are going to be obviously negative, folks. They come with smooth words. Uh, they, uh, uh, they come with good words, fair words, beautiful words. Not only beautiful words, but eulogeo. Same, same word here with you uh, as the prefix, and you is well or, uh, uh, or good. Or uh, it's The translation, however, depends on the usage, and the usage would be for flattering. Flattering speech, we could translate it. So they come with beautiful words or smooth words and flattering speech. That's how they come. They come with the purpose of deceiving you. Satan came to the garden and he didn't come in and say, I'm safe, look out, uh, wench, here I am. He came in light. He came as the shining one. Nahash, the Hebrew says, he came as the shining one. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ was the bright and morning star and now the shining one comes dressed in clothed in light so that he can deceive. And the first thing he says is, uh, Yea, hath God said? <laughs> That's, I take that from our little the cartoon that we used in our kids back. Right about, yeah, uh, doubt. You see, he doubts. He, he creates doubt about the word of God. Then he says, You will not die. He denies it what God says, you see. And then he deceived. He said, you will become like God. And beloved, from the beginning, he has not changed this. And that's why when I went to the doctrine of evil, when I talked about Satan, I have laid this groundwork and I have done it so you will not be deceived because there will be those who will come from outside and those who will rise up from within the local church for the purpose of deceiving believers and to lead them astray and cause them to, to not bring glory to God, but in some way to, uh, to actually become a hindrance to the plan program uh, of God. And so I warn you about these things that I will do as Paul did. Paul said, day and night I did not cease to warn you of the danger. One of these days I'm going to be uh, going to hear that glorious sound. Come on home. I, uh, I hope it's the rapture. But if it isn't, it'll be uh, through the, uh, uh, the matter of, uh, of uh, dying and uh, trusting that it'll be dying grace. I hardly know the difference between here and there. It'll be so glorious uh, here and so glorious there. I'll step across that divide and I'll be gone. And I'll be in the presence of the Lord. After all, even though I live 20 more years, I've, I've lived 60, so I have most of my life gone. I'm sure I'm not going to live another 60. I guarantee you that. I'm positive of that. But whatever it may be, whether it's one day, one month, one year, ten years, twenty, who knows what I have left. But one thing is sure, I have warned you, and I have told you, and I have laid this down before you so clearly that there should be no one, and yet, tragically, I know that there are members of our congregation, those who are watching on television, many of you who are listening by means of radio, at this point in time, you are being dupes of the devil. Back uh, during the time of the, uh, uh, the uh, before Mr. Nixon became president in the, in the McCarthy era, and they had all these, uh, the communist scare, if you remember, uh, that, that are, they looked down their nose at and say today that it was not real. But it was. I lived through it. I was uh, uh, very discerning at the time uh, uh, because I studied everything that was available on it. There was and still is a communist conspiracy to take over the world. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't been able to do it because they have nothing to offer. There really is nothing to offer unless a person has nothing, and then they, they but they're dupes. People, they'll dupe people. They'll, they, uh, but we had what we called at that time fellow travelers. Fellow travelers are people who don't think for themselves, but they, they travel along with whatever they hear. The Bible describes them as, uh, uh, in Ephesians... Uh, chapter 4, 
uh, when he says um, that they are um, uh, carried about by every wind of doctrine. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. You see, the purpose of the ministry as given by spiritual gifts, the spiritual gifts of the ministry given in Ephesians 4.11 is to give some uh, prophets and some uh, 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 apostles, and those are no longer in operation. Those spiritual gifts have already gone. Then he says he's given two more spiritual gifts, evangelists and pastor teachers. The syntax indicates that the pastor teacher is one person. The evangelist is someone who has the ability to make the gospel clear, and the pastor teacher is someone who has the ability to make the gospel clear, and it is a gift from God. And what is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of this is found in verse 4, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. The saints are the members of the, of the royal family, the church. The church is to do the work of the ministry. Then he goes on to point out that the objective is that we may attain a unity of faith, a oneness of the faith, till we become mature believers, spiritual maturity. We become invisible heroes uh, in this world uh, till we have the character of Jesus Christ formed in us. All of this is found in verse 13. And then we have verse 14. And verse 14 says this, that as a result, here is the result of spiritual advance. This is why God wants the pastor teacher to teach you and to warn you. As a result, we be no longer children Now, children are run totally and completely by emotion. We're not going to be children. Then he tells us that the that person who is a child is, first of all, tossed here and there by waves. They are overwhelmed by any adversity. No believer should ever be overwhelmed by adversity because he knows what? The plan of God. The plan of God. The plan of God. The resources of God. The grace of God. The grace of God. That, that uh, there's nothing that comes in your life that will cause you to be overwhelmed because the plan of God made provision for it in eternity past. Overwhelmed by adversity. But also, then he goes on to say, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, unstable, uh, whatever comes along, uh, they go along with. Somebody says this, somebody writes that, somebody comes along into their life and says this, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's exactly what they are. That's what, exactly what they do. Pop from here to there. Depending on what is the current trend, what is, what is the current uh, wind that's blowing. What is the wind blowing? Whatever it is, they go along with it. And of course, God is leading me. They don't have a, any ability to check it out the, by thus saith the Lord. What does the Word of God say? They don't know enough. They don't have any basis for, to, 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 put, to put, try the spirits, whether they be of God or of men. That's what John tells us in 1 John chapter 4. Try the spirits. Put the spirits to the test. They're out there. Why do you, how do you test them? Uh, by a litmus? No. Do you test them by uh, dropping some uh, chemical? No, no, no. You test them by the canon, the canon of Scripture, the completed, written Word of God and no other way. Put what they say up against the Word of God in careful exegesis from the original languages, rightly dividing the Word of Truth so that you don't get mixed up between Old and New Testament, which is what so many are doing today and causing so many problems carried about by every wind of doctrine, then it says, by the trickery of men. And really what that word is saying, when it says trickery of men, it's talking about, here's the Greek word, pan or gia. Pan is from every, and orgia means ready to do anything. It's, it comes from our uh, energy, O-U, I left out the R, uh, R, G-I-A, panorgia, the readiness to do anything. That's how it works. They are ready to do anything. Uh, the uh, uh, trickery, they're, they're, uh, any, anything is all right. The end justifies the means. Look out for that. Then he goes on to say, 
by the craftiness in deceitful scheming. But the Greek word that is used in that phrase really says this. It talks about methodia. M-E-T-H-O-D-I-A. And methodia has to do with the... Well, we could use schemes. That's all right. But the key word has to do uh, with the... Uh, um, the, the there's a there's called the slight. This is the word. Here's the word. K U B E I A. This is the word we get our word cube from. And the word cube originally meant dice. It means playing dice with the devil, and the dice are loaded. That's really what the whole what this uh, this concept is. <laughs> you can't win. Playing. Have you ever played? Uh, seen uh, uh, anybody walk away from? from uh, the uh, Reno or Las Vegas or wherever they be, uh, as a winner, one or two people. If everybody won, they'd be out of business. You cannot win when you gamble. It cannot be done. How many people don't win the lottery every month in this state or in any state? Most people. Nobody. And the person who wins 99 out of 100 times, they're, they're worse off after they have finished than they were at the beginning. The point is you can't play dice with the devil because you lose. That's what happens. You will not be involved in that. All of these things that I have pointed out here, you will not be involved in if, if, if you are a growing, advancing, spiritual believer. And you are, but you see all these things are the way that you can be distracted from the truth. And so I encourage you, be very, very careful about the spirits, quote-unquote, that are out there. Thank you, Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit use these things as a source of challenge and enlightenment so that your precious royal family, both here and those who are watching and listening, your precious royal family may be protected against the methody of the wiles, the strategies, the schemes of the devil. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.